Hello again, all astronomers. I'm glad to see you. Uh, we are now moving on to uh, chapter 17. I hope that you enjoyed looking at the sun. Don't look directly at the sun, but of course we were looking at the sun in different ways. The sun in chapter 15 and 16 is our nearest star. We're going to look at other stars uh, sort of generally over the course of this lecture and the next few lectures. We'll be talking about what stars are, what's inside of them, how we get information from them, light that's coming off of them, how we can measure distances to them, and all sorts of other kinds of things, including the life and death of stars, which of course ends up with very interesting things along the way. So um, one of the things you can see in my backdrop here is that we have a sort of a time-lapse photograph centered upon our North Pole, which would be here. As you watch the North Pole, of course, everything seems to tilt around it. Uh, one of the things I'll also point out in this uh, uh, little uh, 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 graphic here, if you sort of look at the, uh, where is it? Over here. Yes, this, this line here. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of looking in the mirror, but not really because it's reflected. So I'm not sure which hand is which. Uh, but notice this little thing here. This is a satellite or maybe perhaps even the space station that's been caught on the time-lapse photograph that we have here. And this time-lapse photograph is probably in the neighborhood of about an hour to an hour and a half at most uh, along the way. And we'll, we'll uh, see some different things about different stars as we're looking at our lecture for chapter 17. So let me see if I can figure out again how to share the screen uh, looks like we've got here analyzing starlight. Yes. And can I have a slideshow? So uh, one of the things you might not be aware of uh, from, from watching this is that when I go to slide, when I go to share the screen, there's a bar across the top that gives me some options. And I have to wait for that to get out of the way before I can actually click on the slideshow button because it hides the slideshow button. Uh, so, so if I'm ever pausing there, I don't know if you can actually see that as part of what it's showing on the screen, but we're going to look at starlight. When we look at the sun, we're looking at starlight very close up. Uh, it's the only star that really affects our atmosphere in the way that uh, the, the light does in intensity, but the light that comes off of the sun is effectively the same light that comes off of all the other stars that we see in the sky. Some stars put out more of their light in the ultraviolet range than the sun. Some put it more, out more in the infrared range than our sun, but uh, it's the same processes with a couple of exceptions uh, for, for larger and older stars that's going on inside. Uh, this time exposure here, uh, and probably I'm going to guess this time exposure is a couple of hours, uh, maybe as much as three hours, you can see different colors that are here. These are enhanced. This is not what you would get from just a normal view. Uh, these are enhanced with filters because most stars don't show their colors this readily to the naked eye. Uh, so, so you need filters and you need time lapse uh, to get these kinds of things. There are some stars, however, that do show a hint of their colors. If you go out and see Betelgeuse, and I'm not talking about Michael Keaton here, uh, you can see a hint of red under good viewing conditions in the atmosphere. Uh, if you look at Rigel, you can see a hint of blue in that as well. And both of those stars happen to be in the constellation Orion. So the next time you see Orion, you may need to wait for uh, a half a year right now from where we are uh, before you see it again. Uh, the, look for that, look for that along the way. But it has to do with uh, temperatures. Some stars are cooler on the surface, some are hotter on the surface. When we talk about light coming off of the star, we talk about its luminosity. The luminosity is how much light is coming off of it. However, we also talk about apparent brightness, how bright it looks like it is to us. I can have two light bulbs. One is a 40 watt bulb and one is a 100 watt bulb. The, that's the luminosity. However, if I take the 40 watt bulb and put it up in front of your face, 
and take the 100 watt bulb and put it down the block, the 40 watt bulb is going to be apparently brighter to you because of the diminishment of light over the space that it takes to get to you. So when we look at the night sky, we're looking not only at different stars with different luminosities, some are brighter, some are dimmer just intrinsically, but some are also closer and some are further away, and that makes a difference as well. Light follows the inverse square law, and if you go back to chapter five, we don't have chapter five as part of our reading assignment, but if you wanna study up a little on light and, and properties of light, uh, you can go back, it is under files there, and you'll notice our figure here is figure 5.5. One of the things to keep in mind is the inverse square law for light. And it is the same as the inverse square law for gravity, essentially. And that is, if you're twice as far away, you get one-fourth the light. If you're three times as far away, you get one-ninth the light. If you're not ten times as far away, you get one-one-hundredth of the light. So light falls off very, very quickly. Gravity does the same thing. It also falls off uh, with distance by a square. Uh, so we call it an inverse square law. That's true for light and for gravity. Uh, in our case, we're looking at light, of course. And here again, we can see in, in a different graphic. I always like to sort of reinforce the same point over and over again. Uh, so, so if it's double the distance, we have one half squared, one fourth as bright. If it's three times as far away, triple the distance, it's one-third squared, one-ninth as bright. Five times as far away, one-fifth squared, one-twenty-fifth as bright. Uh, so when we think about Neptune in our solar system, for example, it is 30 AUs away from the sun. We're one AU. AU is an astronomical unit. It's how far we are away from the sun here on Earth. Neptune is 30 times further away. What does that mean? That means it's 1 30th squared or 1 900th of the light that's coming off of the sun that reaches us reaches Neptune. It's basically the sun for Neptune is just a bright dot. Uh, the moon is brighter in our nighttime sky than the sun is in Neptune's sky because of the inverse square law. When we sort of look at apparent magnitudes, there are things that look brighter and things that look dimmer uh, along the way. This is, again, what we see, not what is intrinsic to it. Uh, so, so the moon looks brighter to us because it's much, much closer than many other things. If we were to be as close to Venus as we are to the moon, Venus would be much brighter. And Venus is the brightest thing in the sky apart from the sun and the moon when it's in the right position because it moves around. Sometimes it doesn't reflect as much light. The same is true for all of the planets. Sometimes they're reflecting more light than other times, and sometimes they're closer to us than at other times because we're all in motion uh, along the way. So, so that's why it says at brightest, Venus and Jupiter will be the, the fourth and the fifth brightest thing in the sky, uh, often the brightest and second brightest thing in the sky at night if we don't have a moon up at the same time. Uh, obviously, the sun is very powerful. It overpowers all of these things in the daytime, except for the moon. You can see the moon during the daytime. You can see the part of the moon that is illuminated by the sun. A lot of people seem to forget that. That's one of those interesting little factoids. Uh, that's there. And then you can see other uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, magnitudes here. Sirius, which is the brightest star in the sky at night, apart from the sun, the brightest star. Uh, for us, it's eight light years away. If we look at Alpha Centauri, it's only four light years away, but it's dimmer than Sirius. What that means is Sirius is a lot brighter than Alpha Centauri. Then we have Betelgeuse here, which is dimmer. Now it's a lot, 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 lot farther away than either Alpha Centauri or Sirius. Uh, then we have Polaris, our pole star. By the time we're getting down to six to seven for uh, magnitude, and notice how the, the lower the number, the brighter it is. It's like a golf score. The lower the number, the bigger, the brighter it is. The higher the number, the dimmer, the fainter it is. So the faintest Thing that we can see in the sky is about between six and seven, depending upon how good your eyesight is and how good the viewing 
is along the way. With binoculars, we can usually get down to about 10. Uh, with my telescopes here in, in my house, I can get down to maybe 12 to 13. A uh, one meter telescope, uh, which means basically that uh, mirror about that large, we can get down to uh, maybe 18. Hubble gets down to about 30. Uh, so, so, and, and the Keck telescopes are on the uh, peak at uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Uh, so so we, we can actually get quite a number of things. The interesting thing here, uh, the Keck Observatory has a uh, sort of twin, uh, uh, twin mirrors that would fill my entire room here. Uh, you can't see the room, but uh, it's, it's sort of, a, sort of take a regular classroom. It has two mirrors that large. When we're talking about the Hubble, we're talking about something that is maybe the size of a king size bed, um, maybe just a little bit larger. But, but they are equivalent. The difference is the Keck has to deal with atmospheric interference. The Hubble doesn't. So you can do a lot more with a lot less when you're up in space. When we look at the night sky, we can see about 2,000, maybe a little bit more distinct stars under the right conditions uh, with the naked eye. We can also see the Milky Way, which is a conglomeration of stars, mostly far enough away that their light bleeds together. I can tell that this, without looking down here to see it's the Atacama Desert in Chile, I can tell just from this photograph that this is a southern a view, this is from the southern hemisphere, because of these two things over here on the left. This is the large and small Magellanic clouds. Those are uh, two of the closest galaxies to our galaxy. Our galaxy is actually pulling them in gravitationally. We're eating them for breakfast, as it were. And we, can, we can't see those from up here in Indiana. You see those from the southern hemisphere. So when you see those cloudy things in a picture, you can know that it is a southern hemisphere image. We can see the Milky Way from the Northern Hemisphere as well as the Southern Hemisphere. Wherever you are, and if you've taken 101, we've already gone over this, but it, I wanna go over it a little bit more as well. You'll see it's figure 2.2. So if you wanna go back and read a little bit more about it, it's in chapter two. That's a, actually a, a, a good thing to remember. If I have a figure that's up there and it says 2.2 or 5.1 or whatever, that comes from one of the other chapters. And you can always sort of go back into those chapters and look things up. Wherever you are on the planet, right above you is your zenith. So if I move over here, my zenith moves with me. If I move over here, my zenith moves with me. So if I'm talking to you and you're socially distanced six feet away and I say, oh, it's right overhead. For you, it's actually not right overhead. It's going to be at an angle away. If it's directly overhead for me, it's not directly overhead for you. So the zenith moves around with you. The horizon is defined as 90 degrees from the zenith sort of 90 degrees in every direction. Oh, my arm disappeared there. Okay. Wish I could do that with fat. I could give up the rowing machine. Uh, so, so the horizon is in every direction, northeast, southwest, away from your zenith, directly overhead. Where we are on the planet determines what part of the sky we can see because the rest of the sky underneath the planet is being blocked. Our planet rotates. It rotates on an axis. We call that the pole. It comes out the North Pole and South Pole. So we think about the sky as also turning, as you can sort of see in our uh, time-lapse photo right behind me here, around the poles. So we just say we have a North Pole, a North Celestial Pole, a South Pole, a South Celestial Pole, when we're dealing with how we see things in the sky. We think about the equator as halfway between them on the Earth. That's the celestial equator is halfway between the North Pole and the South Pole as well. We've got this one more weird thing that's out there called the ecliptic. And that's because we're a little bit tilted on our axis. So as we are uh, going around the sun, we're tilted on our axis as we spin. Our North Pole is actually tilted right now, 23 and a half degrees from the plane in which we go around the sun. And we're tilted right now towards Polaris. 
So there is a North Pole, Pole Eris, Pole as in it's at the Pole Eris as a word meaning star. Uh, we, you'll find there are lots of Greco-Roman, Greek and Latin terms uh, in, in uh, uh, science. So, so Pole Eris basically literally means pole star. Uh, it's not always the pole star. We move around a bit over 26,000 years, but for right now and for the rest of my life and your life and for the next couple of hundred years at a minimum, uh, we're going to have Polaris as the undisputed pole star. It's been there for hundreds, if not a couple of thousand years. Uh, most of the pole stars last for at least a couple of thousand years along the way. But again, there's a judgment call there. There is no south polar star but there is a constellation called the Southern Cross, and it points towards the South Pole, where the polar star would be if there was one. This is a time-lapse photo, again, uh, taken from a Southern location, and we can sort of see it's probably about an hour. Why do I say it's about an hour? Why do I keep making these pronouncements about these figures? Well, think about what else in your house hanging on the wall might be circular that tells time. Ah, it's a clock. Yeah, so if you think about this as being about maybe 1.30 here and maybe 2.30 here, this little arc here, that's about 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. This one out here looks like it may be 2.45 to 3.45. We look at this one over here, it looks like it might be 9 to 10. See, even the ones out here in the distance or ones close in all seem to be about an hour around if this if we superimposed uh, clock hands on it. That's how I can tell. That's how you can tell for the exposure. If this were a 24-hour exposure, guess what? You wouldn't see anything because 24 hours would give you daytime. What happens to the stars during the day? It would just be a blue sky. You would not see any of these. If it were 12 hours and you had 12 hours of darkness, it would be a half circle. They would all be half circles along the way. So as things go through the sky, they go in a pattern. Everything rises in the east and sets in the west. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. All of the stars rise in the east and set in the west, except for the ones that are close to the poles, and they are called circumpolar stars, but they still move in the same direction as everything else along the way. And that's because our planet is spinning west to east, so it makes everything look like it's going in the opposite direction. So just sort of to keep in mind all of these little things, we have the North Pole and the South Pole. To distinguish between it being on the planet and being out in space, we use the word celestial. We have the celestial poles here. We have the equator that comes off of our equator, so we can divide the northern sky from the southern sky. The zenith is dependent upon you, so it's not just, if you go to the North Pole and look straight ahead up, that's actually your zenith there, but if you come back down to Indiana, you have a new zenith. The zenith is not the North Pole, unless you're at the North Pole. And of course, then we have Polaris, which is the star at the North Celestial Pole. If you move down the planet or up the planet, you will see different parts of the sky and you'll have different kinds of, of uh, views. If you're standing at the North Pole, Polaris is directly overhead and everything seems to be going in a circle like that. If you're standing at the equator, it's 90 degrees down, Polaris is there and everything seems to be going around like that. Here in Indiana, Polaris is in the north, but it's about 40 degrees up. One of the shorthands is if you stick your hand out like this, your fist is roughly 10 degrees, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Hey, I made it. So 90 degrees, nine fists. Well, if you want to look at po for Polaris, go outside one clear evening, look directly north, which where I'm sitting, it's going to be over there, and say, okay, it's about 10, 20, 30, 40, it's going to be roughly right there. And that will be it. That will also be on the end of the handle for the Little Dipper, Ursa Minor, the little bear. There are also two stars in the Big Dipper, Ursa Major, the big bear, that point towards that. And you can get used to figuring those things out. As we go around the sun, parts of the sky get blocked over time. So if we're here in June, and right now when I'm recording this, this is a class in June. Uh, so if we're right here, 
See, part of the, the earth is facing the sun, that's daytime. Part of the earth over here is facing the nighttime. So the constellations in our sky right now in June that you could see would be Sagittarius, Scorpius, Libra. These are the ones that intersect with that tilt that I was talking about before, uh, the ecliptic, and you have that word down here in, in the verbiage down here. Now you might say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Libra isn't in June, Libra is in October. How do I know that? Because that's when I was born. And by that point, the Earth will be over here. Well, guess what? When the Earth is over here, this is the daytime side, the sun's blocking Libra. What you see in the nighttime sky will be Aries, Pisces, Aquarius. If you know your horoscope sign, you typically know your sun sign. See, so Libra would be light shining in this way through the sun towards you on the earth, but you can't see it because it's in the daytime sky. So you have to wait another six months before you get it over here. So all of your horoscopes are wrong, by the way. So, so uh, I may throw up a kind of extra credit thing uh, in the future because it has to do, remember I mentioned that wobble? We're wobbling every 26,000 years and the North Star isn't always the North Star. Guess what? All the things that were written about horoscopes and where things are in the sky were written thousands of years ago. They're predicated on things that were thousands of years ago looking at where the stars are, and they've all moved. Actually, we have moved, so they have apparently moved since then, so you're all at least a month off. See, I, my sign is actually stop, you know, in the name of love, think it over. Uh, if I ever read a horoscope that says, today is a day to binge on Netflix, stay in bed, and eat mint chocolate chip ice cream, I will become a believer. Until then, no. So, but zodiac signs can be useful for astronomy purposes because they are very familiar constellations. And they're very familiar constellations in the same part of the sky that the sun, the moon, and the planets are in along the way. So we call these the ecliptic constellations, also the zodiac constellations. Uh, there is one missing one, you may have noticed, I skipped over it over here, Ophiuchus. And Ophiuchus is one of those that got dropped out along the, the way in history. And one of the things that might be also an extra credit thing in the future, I might ask you to look up some stuff on that. Again, as I mentioned before, we're tilted. We're tilted at 23 and a half degrees. That also is not stable. We wobble just a little bit. Sometimes we're tilted at 21 degrees. Sometimes we're tilted at 25 degrees. Right now we're about halfway in between. That wobble isn't very quick either. We're not gonna wake up tomorrow at 21 degrees and wake up three weeks from now at 25 degrees. That wobble takes thousands of years as well. But that can also impact climate change. Where we're pointed in the sky, towards Polaris or towards some other star like Vega, which 13,000 years from now we will be, whether we're tilted more or less, all of these things affect the climate on our planet. Uh, but nothing affects it more than the tilt, because the tilt is the reason why we have seasons. Planets that do not have tilts do not have seasons. Planets that do have tilts do have seasons. And here we are with that wobble that I was talking about. Right now, we are pointed towards Polaris. And within 13,000 years, we're going to wobble. It's a process called precession. We will be tilted towards Vega. When that happens, it will be summer in the Northern Hemisphere in December. It will be winter in the Northern Hemisphere in July. If you don't think that's going to affect the climate, guess again. But it's not going to be all of a sudden, mm, we go like this. It's going to be a very slow motion. So slow that most people didn't notice. But we'll have several North Stars over the course of 26,000 years. Thuban is one of them. Kokab is one of them. Vega is one of them. There are several that are prominent stars that are on this arc before we'll come back to Polaris. And this will continue again and again and again for many, many cycles. And if we go back far enough in the past, about maybe 500,000 years, something like that, uh, there were a couple of other stars in this wobbly area that were twin pole stars. And we had uh, uh, Aldebaran and Capella as very close to each other in the sky. They were actually not very close to each other in, in reality. But it's sort of like if you look at them in the sky, 
and you're sort of looking at them like this, you can say, oh, they look close, but in fact, they're, yeah. Um, so, 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 uh, but they have since moved on their own way along the way. So, so, but notice 5,000 years ago, Thuban was our North Star. Well, so this is 5,000 years of movement here. So we would have been about here 3,000 years ago. That's when those records of stellar locations that are used for horoscopes were written down when we were pointed here. So we're actually more than 10% off or more than a month off, most of them. Now here's a picture of Orion. Orion is one of the constellations in our sky prominent uh, in, in, in the winter. As I mentioned before, Betelgeuse gives us a coloration of red. This is enhanced because again, it's time-lapse photograph, but you can get a hint of the red uh, from, from just naked eye viewing. This one's Rigel down here. Uh, you can see there are three stars in the belt of Orion. Those are very easy to pick out. There's also an area here that under the right conditions, you can see a little bit of wispy gas, uh, especially with binoculars or, or even a low power telescope. Uh, this is a stellar nursery. And we'll talk about that when we talk about uh, nebulae because the Orion Nebula has, has a, a really good and well-researched uh, stellar nursery. When we look at the constellations, there are 88 of them. There are 88 official constellations, according to the uh, uh, International Astronomical Union. Different cultures have had different constellations, though. Uh, so, so sometimes in reading history books, you may come across different constellations that aren't the official ones today. Uh, so, so different ones will, will pop up every now and then. Uh, but in terms of our, our star maps today, 88, if you're a pianist, you might remember there are 88 keys on the piano. There are 88 constellations. Some of them look more like what they're talking about. Scorpius, Scorpion, Sagittarius, we've got sort of a ram here. Orion, the hunter, sort of arms out. Doesn't have a head and legs, makes it hard to hunt, but there you go. Uh, Canis Major, Canis Minor, Canis Major down here, the big dog, canine, the little dog, that's Sirius, the bright star that I mentioned before. They don't look so much like a dog in these modern renderings, but you can find other star maps that do give you that kind of uh, 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 sort of reading. So that's just a really quick introduction to constellations and stars. One of the early catalogers of these kinds of things was a guy named Hipparchus, and he sorted the stars into magnitudes, and that's we, we still have the remnants of that today. Uh, that's why we have our Alpha Centauri at, at zero, and, and we have our, our Sirius in, in the negative range, and the sun way off in the negative range. Uh, so so he, he just divided them according to what he could see, it was an attempt at science. I wouldn't call it scientific, but it was a good attempt at science for his time because no one had really done things like this before. Uh, so, so we'll give him credit for being one of the first ones to catalog and try to discern which ones are brighter and which ones are dimmer. Uh, this is all apparent magnitude. He had no idea that they might be farther away or closer, or some might be inherently brighter or inherently dimmer. Uh, so, so one of the things that we see is that once we began to do that kind of observation, we needed to adjust what we were looking at. And so really during the 19th century, the 1800s, we began to get more and more precise with different things. It didn't just sort of jump from Hipparchus 2,400 years ago to uh, the, the, the 1800s. There were other star maps and other catalogers along the way, but, but not any major, major significant improvements on what Hipparchus did in terms of the magnitudes. Uh, there were people like Tycho Brahe who had the fake nose. I'll talk about him at some point later in our, our, our ter term. Uh, he's my favorite older astronomer. Um, for a couple of different reasons, not just the fake nose, but uh, he cataloged a lot of stars, uh, perhaps more than anyone before him, although uh, I, I sometimes debate that because his last few hundred stars were sort of a rush job, you know, you, you, it's the night before the final exam and you have to turn it in really quickly, so it's like, okay, write this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, yeah, the last few hundred stars in the catalog weren't all that good. Uh, 
but we do have a leftover of that. If we look at stars through something like the Hubble, we can get these really gorgeous star fields. Uh, we can see the different colorations being brought out by the filters and, and the way we look at the stars. Uh, and and look, the way we look at stars can be interesting as well. I think it's chapter six that we talk a lot about in, in, the, in the textbook in your files that we talk a lot about uh, telescopes. Uh, so, and I, I will bring up some things now and then, especially with the Hubble. Uh, I, I will probably have a special thing just on the Hubble so that you can sort of see some of the stuff that's happening there. And also on the Spitzer telescope, which is in my view just as significant if not more so than the Hubble in many ways scientifically. Uh, but, but this we can see the stars are probably about 25,000 uh, light years away. Uh, so, so we're not even talking about AUs here, we're talking way, way, way far away uh, 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 along the way. Uh, but what we're also looking at is that we're looking at some that are brighter, some that are dimmer, some that are cooler. Those reddish stars are pretty cool on the surface. Uh, but you can see that even though they're cool, they might be brighter because they are physically larger. Betelgeuse is physically larger by a large clip than Sirius, which is a very bright star. And Sirius is physically larger than our sun, in addition to being hotter on the surface along the way. So when we look at colors and temperatures, things that are hotter look blue, things that are dimmer look red, because what's coming off of them, if you're in a cooler range, the majority of the energy coming off of that star is in the infrared. If you're in the bluer range, uh, the, the, the majority of the energy coming off the star is in the blue range. So what we're seeing with our Roy G. Biv eyes in fact, is the closest part of Roy G. Biv to where most of the energy is coming from, from those stars. So, so always think red is cooler, lower energy. It might be brighter overall because it's a larger thing. If I have a very bright pinpoint light, it might be brighter intrinsically, but if I have this huge disk that's even a sort of low wattage light, you may get more light off of that in total. Uh, so, so think about that when you're thinking about uh, stars as well. As stars get hotter on their surface, the luminosity goes up by the power of four here. Uh, so, so remember, as things go away from us, they diminish by a square. We're going up to the power of a quad, the power of four here. So if a star is twice as bright, as the other, it'll be 16 times, two times, two times, two times, two, four times, four, 16. It'll be 16 times the level of energy that's coming off of that star. If it's three times as hot on the surface, then the luminosity is going to be 81, three times, three times, three times, three, or nine times nine is 81 of the energy level from that. If it's 10 times hotter, then you're going to get 10,000 times the energy that's coming off of the star, 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, that's four zeros. So, so that's how the luminosity works in terms of relative values. Uh, some of the people uh, who, who we can credit with that include the Huggins here. Uh, they look like a wild and crazy bunch uh, <laughs> that, that, that's here. What, what we see is uh, uh, sometimes we have what we might consider the stereotypical mad scientist look, and, and I think they've got it down pat here. Uh, we also see almost the, the forerunner of Einstein. We think of Einstein with the hair in, in all of that different way, but Einstein came along later. Uh, so maybe he saw a picture, especially of Margaret Huggins here, and said, that's the hairstyle for me. Uh, so <laughs> you never know. You never know where people get the ideas. I don't have a choice to have either of theirs, as you can see. It's just all gone. Uh, but one of the things they did, one of the things they are, they are uh, perhaps best noted for, is that they were beginning to identify lines in the spectrum of stars and take photographs of these spectra. What do I mean by that? I mean that different stars have different elements in them. They have hydrogen, they have helium, some of them have oxygen, some of them have carbon, some of them have other kinds of, of elements that are in there. You might think back to chemistry class where you had the big uh, uh, chart of elements and hydrogen's up in one corner and helium's up in the other. And then you have all the other uh, elements that are in there 
what's happening inside of most stars is that hydrogen is being slammed together into helium. If they're really hot and older stars, the helium might get slammed into making heavier and heavier and heavier elements. So what we have is the energy from the star will be reflective of the elements that are in the star. That gives us what are known as spectral lines. And we have spectral classes, this O, B, A, F, G, K, M, the basic spectral analysis. What happens is when we look at light sort of coming off of something with hydrogen, the molecules, well, the atoms actually, uh, they're usually in, in a molecular form when they're out uh, uh, of, of the stellar region when they're on the stars, because we can do this with things other than stars too. Uh, but, but when we look at the atoms, there, are, there is an electron buzzing around the proton. Hydrogen is very simple. It has one proton, it has one electron. But it buzzes around in certain states. Sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's further away from the, from the proton. So if it's in a lower state or a higher state, it's going to give off an energy line or a spectra. Uh, and, and there are four main energy lines that we see in hydrogen here. We have lower energy, remember red, higher energy in blue. Uh, sodium has just this one that's here uh, in, in our Roy G. Biv area. Helium has five here. Mercury has a bunch. The more complex elements often have more, but not necessarily. Helium, helium is a special thing. Let me tell you a little bit of a story here with helium. Helium is named for star stuff or the sun, helios is a Greek term for sun or star stuff. Uh, and, and we discovered helium on the sun before we discovered it here on Earth. What was happening? Notice we've got three lines over here. We've got three lines up here in hydrogen. We've got one strong line here and one strong line here. We've got this line that looks like sodium. So at first we thought, well, we were seeing hydrogen and sodium in a, some weird capacity. The blue lines here are closer and the, the, the yellow line here isn't as intense, but we had this weird extra line over here. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Think about what helium is for a moment. If, you're, if you've ever taken a balloon full of helium and sucked it in, and then you turn it to a chipmunk, it's like, okay, you're Mickey Mouse for, for a couple of minutes there. What did the helium taste like? You can't remember because it doesn't. What did it smell like? You can't remember because it do doesn't. If you're remembering any taste or smell, unfortunately, that's the balloon. That's not the helium uh, that's there. So it's like, nah, nah. Uh, but But uh, if you don't know that it's there and it doesn't smell like anything and it doesn't taste like anything, and you open up a pocket or a cavern of helium and it escapes, how do you know it's escaping? It's also not flammable. It's not going to catch on fire like the Hindenburg or anything like that. So. We discovered it on the sun. We, in fact, there were scientists who thought this only exists on the sun and stars. It doesn't exist on Earth. Until then, we started finding it here on Earth. Uh, but we can look at these lines coming off of the sun, and we can tell the solar chemistry. We can look at the lines coming off of other stars and tell the stellar chemistry. The really weird thing is just almost like in, in terms of history, a day before we were able to do this, there was a guy in France named Comte who said, oh, the stars are so far away and we'll never be able to figure out what they're made of. There's no way possible. And then boom, here, this came along. Uh, so so uh, that, that was an interesting thing. When we look at the different lines that are coming off of different stars, again, we have our spectral types over here. We can see some have more intense lines than others. Some have more uh, distinct lines. Some have different elements in them along the way. So, so uh, when we're, we're sort of looking at uh, this, like it says here, the spectral type A1, we see the Balmer lines. We, we look at it and we've got this line here, this line here, this line here, this line here. Those are the key lines. Those are those four lines of hydrogen uh, that's there. I'm not going to have you memorize which lines are which or anything like that. Just generally be aware that this is how we do the chemistry of stars. Uh, because essentially, there, there are only 92 
naturally occurring elements. Uh, so, so what we can do is in a lab, take the lines off of them and then hold up the lines to see what's happening inside of stars. Sometimes it's just that simple. Then we have anti-jump cannon. Anti-jump cannon is a calculator. Uh, once upon a time, if you took your calculator to class, it meant you took this woman along with you. A uh, calculator was once upon a time a person and a job. This was someone who sat and did calculations all day long, usually with a pencil, didn't have a calculator, didn't have a computer, and often they would work for 10 or 12 hours a day, sometimes six days a week. Uh, that was a heavy load. And we had a group called the Harvard Calculators, of which Annie Jump Cannon was one of the uh, premier members, and they spent their lives working through the data. They went, went through and, and put all of these classifications together. And here's a picture that I don't think is from your textbook. I think I pulled this from somewhere else because I wanted to highlight what's going on here. Here's Annie Jump Cannon and the Harvard calculators. Notice there's one man in the picture. Notice everyone else is a woman. Guess who the astronomer is? You guessed it, it's Mr. Grumpy back there. I actually don't know his name. I should find out his name. I'll see if I can find out his name. I've been using this, this picture for a while. Uh, I think I told a little bit of a story of my math teacher uh, in chapter 15, 16. Uh, that person actually reminds me when I look at this picture of a cross between these first two ladies here in the front. She used to have hair like that and used to dress like that. I, I, and one of the things I never knew was because it's a little bit eccentric, especially in the 1970s to be dressing like this. Why did she dress like that? She may have been doing that as an homage, as a way of honoring some of the women that she had been inspired by. I wish she were still alive so I could ask her. Uh, because that it, I, I, I see her when I see this picture. Uh, but when we look at spectral lines, these are what those ladies were looking at and trying to piece together all the data that came off of other stars, and they would do their calculations, because you can put math to all of this, but we're not going to be doing that in our conceptual astronomy class here so much. But one of the things they did was they figured out that different lines show up or not, in large part based on the temperature that's there. And the hottest stars are O-type stars, and the dimmer stars are the ones that are down here, the M-type stars along the way. There are actually a couple more uh, spectral types that go on beyond this along the way. But these are the primary ones. Now, why are they out of order? And that's because at one point, someone had put them in order, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and all of that. And it turned out that they were wrong. But what they did was instead of just reclassifying all the hottest as A and then the next level B and stuff like that, they shifted the classifications. So if you've ever studied music, uh, I mentioned this with regards to the, the piano, uh, uh, 88 keys on the piano, uh, 88 constellations in the sky. You may learn your musical notes on the staff by F-A-C-E as, as the notes in the treble clef, or every good boy does fine, or every good boy deserves fudge, or, or something like that. And then you have the, the, the other uh, uh, ways of remembering things with mnemonics. Well, how are you going to remember this? O-B-A-F-G-K-M. Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. Well, that only really worked when astronomers were the men. Uh, so, so now, of course, only boys accepting feminism get kissed meaningfully. There you go. You can make up your own one, but oh, be a fine girl, kiss me is the old traditional one. And of course, now that we don't relegate any jump cannon to simply being a calculator, uh, which, is, which is really not a, a good part of our history, except that that's our history, uh, we, we have other ways of doing these things. O stars tend to be really hot. They tend to be blue in color. Uh, B stars are also hot, but they're diminishing a li little bit. They tend to be bluish and white. Uh, A stars tend to be white hot. Sirius, our dog star, the brightest star in our sky, is one of those. Vega also is a bright star. Rigel uh, is, uh, again, the blue star that we can see at the bottom of the Orion constellation. 
uh, yellow, white, the F star, uh, uh, F stars tend to be about 10 to 20 percent hotter than our sun. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, uh, Canopus as, as, as one of the examples there. Then we're a G star. Our star is a G star. Uh, the sun there, Capella is another one. Uh, remember that was one of our twin pole stars half a million years ago. Then we go down uh, into orange and red, and we even have magenta stars and infrared. These aren't even hot enough to be throwing off regular light in Roy G. Biv. Uh, so, so these we will often call brown dwarfs, but we have sort of reclassified them. But notice we've got the oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, or only boys accepting fem feminism get kissed meaningfully. Here we've got these few additions. These were not there because we couldn't see these stars when those classifications were being put together. Our equipment wasn't sensitive enough, and we keep finding more and more stuff. Uh, here we can see some different brown dwarfs compared to our sun. Uh, uh, just for size comparison, here's Jupiter. Uh, for size comparison also, this little dot, this little sunspot would probably be about the size of the Earth. Uh, so we have several stars that are getting down close to Jupiter size. Jupiter is not a failed star. It would need to really be about nine to ten times larger than it is to qualify for that, but it is a seedlet of a star. And these have ten times as much material or more as Jupiter has, but it's sort of like packing more and more and more and more stuff into a suitcase. The suitcase stays the same size until you just pack too much and then it begins to grow and expand and burst out. But, but because this is gas, you can put more and more and more and more and more gas into these. These begin to expand out over here because the heat inside begins to push out or the engine kicks on in a star like the sun and begins to push out in that way. So as we're looking at different types of stars, if we're sort of looking at a blue uh, a giant here, the majority of its light is going to come off in the UV area here. But what we see, we're going to be seeing the majority closer to the UVs that are here. And uh, then, then uh, just so you can have a size comparison as well, this would be about the size of our sun. Uh, so, so, uh, or, or, or a white dwarf left over from our sun. So within the stars, we have different ways of identifying what's happening there. We can take readings off the corona, which is the, the atmosphere. We can take a, uh, a reading off the surface. One thing to keep in mind, the absence of an element spectral lines doesn't mean the element itself is missing because there are different kinds of things that, that can interfere with the way that we read things and the way that we see things. Uh, so so uh, we, we can say, for example, if we have two stars, same pressure, same temperature, and all of that, but they're stronger sodium lines, that one single yellow line uh, that, that we were talking about. One is stronger than the other. Stronger lines mean there are more atoms in the photosphere absorbing light uh, that, that's there. So, so, so that, that gives us an abundance. But there are always relative abundances, and there are always, uh, issue, there are always issues with how we're reading things. In the early days of doing this, one of the problems was we were getting readings off of our own atmosphere in addition to what was coming off of the sun or the stars. When we're looking at the lines also, they might be Doppler shifted. A uh, Doppler shift is like when a fire engine goes by. As it's coming closer to you, the pitch is higher. As it's going past you, it goes down lower. That's because the waves that are coming off of the siren as it's coming towards you are pushing the waves that are already out in the air up. And it's giving them more energy, the pitch goes up. As it goes past you, the siren's still putting out the, the, the waves, but there are waves already in the air, so it's acting as a baffle. And the, the energy, the pitch goes down. That happens in light too. So as things are going away from us, the light waves baffle each other and they are lowered in energy in red shifting. If it's coming towards us, they're pushed up in energy, so they're blue shifted. And notice these lines here. 
So th this would be stationary if it's just sort of sitting, sitting there not doing much. If it's going away from us, notice all the lines are shifted towards the red. That doesn't mean these lines end up in the red, it just means they're shifted in that way. Notice all of these, if it's coming towards you, are shifted towards the blue. It doesn't mean they're all in the blue, it just means they're all going in that direction. Now one of the things that we can do is figure out also something like the spin of the sun, because as the sun spins, as it rotates, on this side, on the side over here, the light is being tugged a little bit, that's going to get a redshift. On the side over here, that's going to get a little kick, that's going to get a blue shift. So when we see redshift, blue shift, redshift, blue shift, redshift, blue shift, we can tell that it's rotating and we can tell the speed that it's rotating. Also, stars actually move on their own. So it's not just the movement of the sky. Very, very slowly, by sort of our standards here on Earth, they are in fact also moving. They move through the galaxy in different ways. So we can watch them move. If we watch the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, for thousands of years, actually tens of thousands of years, we would actually see the shapes begin to shift. As those stars move, they don't just move across the sky, but some are moving towards you and some are moving away from you. Uh, those kinds of motions of the stars are called proper motions, as that's to distinguish it from the movement in the sky that's caused by us rotating, the Earth rotating. But if a star is moving like this towards us or like this away from us, we might call that uh, a straight line motion or an angular motion, but we measure it and call it the radial velocity uh, of, of the star. How fast is it coming towards us or going away from us along the way? Uh, Barnard star, if we go way, way back, uh, hold on with me here for a moment. Let's go back to uh, one of our charts here because it mentioned it. Oh, I didn't know it was this far back. There we go. It's this one here. Notice this Barnard star here. It's right at the point where it's one of the objects that's visible with binoculars. For many, many, for most of history of astronomy, we didn't know Barnard star existed uh, because we couldn't see it with the naked eye, uh, even under the best of conditions along the way. But as soon as we started to get telescopes, even low-grade telescopes, we, we discovered Barnard star and discovered that it's actually relatively close to us and it's booking through the sky pretty fast. Uh, uh, along the way. Here we are, we see in, in its uh, sort of proper motion. Uh, here's just over 20 years. Uh, we have it here, now we have it down here. Notice we've got these two stars, one bright and one and faint, one bright and one faint here. Here's bright and faint. Notice it's moved and moved and moved. It's, this is not because the Earth is moving. This is on its own as it is moving along the way. When we look at the Dipper, the Big Dipper here. We can see the different stars that are part of the Big Dipper. Some are moving this way, some are moving that way. So 50,000 years ago, this lopsided thing is what it looked like 50,000 years from now. It'll look like it's sort of collapsing and opening up. But these stars that we see, and they seem to form a pattern, actually aren't related to each other. They're not gravitationally interested in each other, and they are far from each other in terms of how close and how far they are in space. So as we measure things, we measure things, uh, we measure the proper motion. One of the things we need to do is sort of figure out where it's going in terms of, is it coming towards us, going away from us? Is it going up or down? Where exactly are these things happening? So we have a lot of different parts that are part of the proper motion of a star. Uh, I'm not going to have you do a lot of, with this, but I want you to be aware of the different kinds of components. And then to add one more thing to this, it's three-dimensional. This is only two-dimensional you're seeing here. So it might not just be doing this or doing this. It could be doing this or could be doing this or could be doing... Uh, there are all sorts of different things. Plus, our own star is moving through the galaxy as well as it goes around the galaxy. It's actually going up and down and up 
and down and up and down. If you think about a warped record, how many of you remember vinyl records? If you think about it, leaving a vinyl record out in the sun and then you bring it and it's warped, you put the needle on it and it goes up and down and up and down. That's what's happening to our sun and many of the stars in the disk of our galaxy. So as I mentioned before, I jumped ahead a little bit. I guess inside I knew it was coming. The Stellar rotation is the star rotating. Our sun in particular, we can do this, but we can do this with many other stars as well. We'll see some of the light coming off of it. It's going to get a blue kick. Some of it is going away from us. We'll get a red shift along the way, depending upon whether it is rotating or not. Uh, we, we will get that, uh, and whether it's rotating faster or slower, we'll get those readings as well. So different kinds of things that we've been able to do is we've been able to measure like Altair. Altair is one of the brighter stars in our sky. It's rotating really fast, six and a half hours. Like, ooh. Our sun rotates about once a month and it rotates differentially. Uh, as, as I mentioned before in chapter 20, or in chapter 15 and 16, that's partly why we get our sunspots because over the course of time, the magnetic lines are twisted because of the differential rotation at the poles and at the equator, it's rotating at different rates because it's not a solid. Whereas Altair is whipping around so fast, there's not a lot of differential rotation that's there, but it's also rotating so fast that it's bulging in the middle. Another thing that's rotating fast enough to bulge in the middle is actually Saturn. Uh, it, it's very oblate, we call that oblate. Uh, as it's sort of a squashed ball uh, that's there. So, so, so it, is, it is rather fast. Uh, Vega is also really fast. Vega is another bright star in our sky and it rotates once every 12 and a half hours. So there are some things that are really whipping around out there. Although this is not fast by comparison to things like pulsars. Keep that in mind. There are things that rotate dozens of times per second or faster that have more mass than these. They're really funky. Now some of the guys who helped figure this out uh, were, were guys named Henry Draper and James Lick. We still have the Lick Observatory uh, that it is uh, a useful place for stellar research. Uh, one of the things that these guys helped to do were to pioneer stellar photography. Uh, Photographs were still relatively new uh, during, during the 1800s. And so trying to get something just in any kind of photograph was uh, a, a, a real uh, chore. It became a, a real art that got developed over the course of time so that we could actually take time-lapse photos and so that we could compare what one person was seeing with what another person was seeing. Because imagine if the only thing you could do is look through a telescope and then draw what you saw. What you're seeing and what you're sharing then is very dependent upon the quality of your drawing. And you can't always trust the drawings, not that anyone's intentionally trying to deceive anyone, but our eyes can deceive our, what, what we, we think we see and Photography, photography can do that as well. So it, it took quite a while uh, along the way. We, we have, uh, 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 during the 1800s also, the growth of larger and larger and larger telescopes. And that sort of culminated into the early 20th century. Uh, Lick provided money for a 36 inch refractor. So if we're sort of thinking about three yards across. Uh, that's actually pretty big. It's nowhere near the 200 inch or, or, or the, the uh, sort of uh, all, all the larger, larger ones that have come along since then. But that was a really huge undertaking in the 1800s. And uh, I, I may highlight a book if I can remember uh, to, to pull it off my shelf the next time I'm in my office uh, that, that talks about the history of telescopes and the history of uh, astrophotography, uh, which is really a, a fascinating thing to share. Um, so so I'll, I'll try to bring that up and try to remember to get that to you. But this is a sort of introduction, a little bit to stars and how we see stars and how we think about them. So I thank you for this and I will see you 
What's the next one? Chapter 18.